kidney health is becoming a much bigger issue in today's world. And, you know, uh, people who are living with di diabetes, one of the primary complications over the course of time is degenerating kidneys and increasing the risk of chronic kidney disease and eventually dialysis. So what happens to your kidneys when you're actually moving your body? Great question. So the kidneys, as you well know, right, are important because they're filtering out our blood and they are made up of all of these tiny little membranes, very delicate membranes, uh, maybe similar to almost like tissue paper, with millions and millions of little layers of you know wet tissue paper together with all of these little tubules, we call them. And along the length of these little hoses or tubules, these little hoses, uh, you know, water, salts, you know, different types of electrolytes are being passed back and forth as the body determines how much salt to hold on to, how much water to hold on to, how much all the different balances of these electrolytes. And that's being influenced at the kidney lever level. So a couple different things can radically influence the health of your kidneys. If you have elevated blood pressure, that it puts excess chronic demand and pressure onto these little tiny fibers of these little tubules. And just like with tissue paper, if you blow too hard on the tissue paper, you can break it. Well, the chronic pressure from the blood going in there at a high you know, systolic level can damage the fibers of these tubules. And as a result, you can get scar tissue instead of having nice, delicate, light uh, you know, I think about it like your kitchen sponge. You got that kitchen sponge on your sink. And when it's brand new, it gets the water and you can squeeze it right out. It's so healthy. But if you've used it for several weeks, it starts getting kind of crusty and hardened with all the crud on it. Uh, well, that's what can happen to our kidneys over time. And now they don't work as well to efficiently absorb and release fluid. And so if you have elevated blood pressure as a result of poor diet, lack of exercise, excess salt consumption, yeah, et cetera, um, you know, excess alcohol consumption, what we know, and chronic stress, what we know is that's going to put increased pressure through the kidneys, and over time, it's going to damage the kidneys, which leads to then kidney dysfunction. Uh, number two along that same line is if you develop atherosclerosis, which is, of course, clogging up of the arteries or along the lining of your arteries, that by itself is going to increase the pressure in your bloodstream and increase damage on the kidneys, just like we spoke of. So for example, if you're running well water through your pipes all day, you're going to get crust along the pipes of your house. Well, if you're eating the standard American diet and you're consuming you know, pizza, French fries, and Mickey D's, and Chick-fil-A, and Haagen-Dazs, that is essentially creating a crust along the lining of your arteries, and that makes your arteries less uh, kind of adaptable to pressure and stress. And the pressure then goes up, which increases the pressure into the kidneys and again, damages the delicate tubules and leads to scarring and dysfunction. And, you know, so the, in addition, as you get um, increased atherosclerosis, you decrease perfusion to the kidney, meaning it can't even get enough blood in there. Uh, and as a result, it's almost like a pump trying to you know, suck something dry and it's not getting enough fluid in there. And again, it causes injury to the kidney. In addition, of course, the chronically elevated blood sugars themselves can lead to glycosylation injury to the kidney, which makes these fibers and tubules not function as well. So there are multiple levels by which when we exercise, we improve the flexibility of our blood vessels so they can adapt uh, opening and closing, dilating and constricting more readily. They can respond to stress and pressure. They can also relax more completely. So our blood pressures on average are lower. Uh, in addition, when we're exercising regularly, we improve generalized perfusion to the tissues. Um, and then as we mentioned, exercise decreases overall total body weight, decreases resting lipids and decreases chronic inflammation. So, and decreases resting blood sugars. So all of these decrease the risk to the kidneys themselves and allow the kidney to be more efficient long-term. Now, when you combine that with a micronutrient-dense plant-based program, like what you, you know, advise your participants to eat, this is just a win-win for the kidneys and helps maintain their health longer and reducing that risk of kidney impairment, kidney failure, uh, and the need for dialysis, which we want to protect people from. That was a that was an unbelievable description. That that was vividly clear, especially the, the the visual of that crusty sponge, which when it's wet, it's nice and supple and it's 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 easy to use. And then you stick it on your sink and it dries up, and all of a sudden it becomes nice and crusty. So thank you for doing that. Um, let's dive a little bit deeper here into kidney health because, like you're saying, there's a very strong connection between using your body and improving your kidney health, which I freaking love. That's incredible. 
But a lot of the people who we talk with have been told that because they already have a struggling kidney or a kidney that's been become inflamed and they either are living with a uh, chronic kidney disease stage one or stage two or stage three, now they're on multiple dietary restrictions. They're told to limit their phosphorus intake, their sodium intake, and their potassium intake. And so that right there eliminates so many different plant-based foods because what we're telling people to do is eat more fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains because that's going to significantly improve your health. But yet their kidney doctor is saying, whoa, 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 hold on a second. I'm trying to lower your phosphorus intake and lower your sodium intake and lower your potassium intake. And if you try and achieve that, then that means that the world of plant-based food all of a sudden becomes really small and it's really hard to achieve. So uh, how, how do you solve that problem? W what would be your recommendations for you know, somebody that's been told to limit their plant food intake? That's a great question. And I see that all the time with patients who are in considering a transitioning to a healthy plant-based program. Um, and the reality is, unfortunately, I think that there are two voices in the room and they are somewhat at odds with each other, somewhat in conflict. And, you know, the reality is when one looks at the statistics with regards to type one, type two, type one and a half diabetes, and progression to renal failure, the standard uh, approach of eating the standard American diet and just using medications is, is a failure. And on average, the, these people progressively see their renal function decline and unfortunately are then told, well, we did everything we could, now it's time for dialysis. And I hate to say this, but obviously that is just a moneymaker for so many doctors because at sixty dollars to $70,000 per person per chair going to dialysis, these renal doctors have no reason to want to get patients better. And I hate to say that, but there is a vested interest that is kind of dark in the background. When we look at individuals who move into a micronutrient-dense, largely protein, low, low-fat, plant-based program like you advocate, what we see is, on average, the majority of those individuals have improved renal function and are able to move away from many of the medications that were compromising their kidneys to begin with and, as a result, have improved health and move away from the cliff of dialysis. But I've seen it time and time again, we put people on four to six weeks of a micronutrient dense plant-based program like I advocate and you do as well, and their renal function improves. People with chronic renal disease stage two and even stage three beautifully moving in a very positive direction. Uh, so I think you know, it's a, it's a challenge for people who hear this message to go, well, wait a second, I'm not allowed those foods. And what I would encourage for those that are especially nervous or concerned is to go slowly and to work with your people, right? To guide them through that process with appropriate, you know, testing and making sure that everything looks good and their numbers are staying where they need to stay and appropriate modifications are being made nutritionally and medication wise. Yeah, that's brilliant, actually. Uh, it's, it's frustrating, actually, for the patient because they have two different voices in their head and they're trying to figure out, should I go left? Should I go right? Should I go left? Should I go right? And, you know, intuitively, I think a lot of people understand and believe that eating a plant-based diet is probably going to be a healthier option in the long term, not only for their kidney, but for many different tissues. But yet there's still this naysayer voice in the back of your head that says, well, the doctor in the lab, white, white lab coat told me that I have to limit, you know, phosphorus, sodium, and potassium. Therefore, I just can't do it. It's too dangerous. So the next question I have now is for uh, a patient. Let's say that there's a patient who's already undergoing dialysis. Okay? They have been doing this for some period of time. It could be a couple of months. Maybe it could be a year. Um, if that patient were to start exercising, does exercise, can you use exercise as a tool to come off of dialysis or is that not, is that too aggressive of a statement? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know of any case reports or case series of people being able to reverse, you know, the need for dialysis purely through exercise. And I think it, this is why it's so crucial, right? Especially for those of us who are early in our kidney dysfunction to make meaningful steps now. Right. So it's, uh, we like, for example, you know, 
you know, it's, it's an analogy would be right. Can you amputate someone's toes and they grow back if they eat healthy, you know, et cetera. The answer is no, there is, sometimes is a limit to the recovery of potential of the human body. But do I think that exercise will be of great benefit to the person who is on dialysis? Absolutely, because it will improve their quality of life. It will slow the progression of disability. It will allow them to have greater muscle mass, lean muscle tissue, and able to, to care for themselves and have adventures for years to come. So for example, one of the things that I was um, we brought up briefly earlier is that you know when you think of yourself in five years, 10 years, 20 years, what do you want to be able to do? Do you want to be able to pick up big boxes of books and stuff from your home if you're moving you know, to an apartment? Do you want to be able to move the big planter in the backyard? Do you want to be able to pick up the 40 pound you know, grandchild that you might have one day and throw them around? Who do you want to be? And you have to ask yourself this question is, are the behaviors that you're choosing today creating the person you want to be in five years? Or are you going to hit five years from now and say, dang it, I I can't even do this. This sucks. Well, it's just because I'm old, right? My grandfather had this great flyer and it said, men and women in your 50s and 60s don't go on the shelf, right? It's not normal to be old at 50 and 60. And that's the reality. But in our society, (coughs) excuse me, we've essentially accepted this abnormality saying that, yeah, when you get 50 and 60, then you're the person who just sits on the porch and watches the other people play and do things. And so it's funny for me, even now, as I approach 50, you know, I am, you know, I have friends over with their kids and I'm the guy out playing tag with the kids in the yard while the other guys are sitting up on the porch, eating and drinking and talking. And I'm just like, yeah, I don't want to sit up there and talk. I want to play, you know, let's go. And so, but again, that comes from the effort and the work and the commitment you put in on a daily basis to care for the vehicle. So you've got to ask yourself the question again, do you want dialysis, right? If you don't want dialysis in your life, what are you doing about it now to prevent that? It doesn't matter that you like the taste of haagen It doesn't matter that you like to sit on the couch. It matters what you want in your life in five years and 10 years from now. And very few people, when they're completely honest, will say, yeah, I just want to sit on the couch, watch Netflix without moving, and eat unlimited buckets of haagen and never move again. Like That's not really what most of us wanted when we were kids, nor is it what we want you know, now. It's not like we're like, ooh, that's my dream life. You know? No, we're like, hey, I'd love to be able to go to Bali or you know, and check out cool things. I'd love to go to this show. I'd love to go to this performance in Vegas. I'd love to go hike this. Well, that's going to come from hard work. That's the reality. And it's the commitment that we put in every day will create the life that we want long term. And exercise is a huge part of that for your kidney health and for the entire rest of your body.